Good morning. Time to find a seat. It's a beautiful, warm day outside today. As much as I, I feel like I've been talking about the weather a lot whenever I get on the microphone because it's been such a nice spring. But I've hit my limit now. It's too hot. I'm ready for rain again. <laughs> Tuesday? Really? All right. Something to look forward to. My uh, two older kids right now are out shooting in an archery tournament with uh, Mike Gallo and a bunch of friends that they've gotten uh, to know through archery. It's kind of funny. Um, we've got two like Olympic level archers up in Nevada County that are youngish. I think one's 15, so that's young, and the other one is in her 20s. And they just hang out with my kids and shoot with them and stuff. So they're not shooting with them this morning because that's a different uh, level than they're shooting at, but it's still pretty cool to see them. I was talking to the dad of the 15-year-old boy, and um, he was introduced, I was introduced to him as Levi and Lily's dad. And uh, he goes, yeah, get used to that. Because from now on, you don't have a name. You're just going to be <laughs> Levi and Lily's dad. And that, that's good. I mean, I, if I'm going to be associated with anybody, I'm pretty proud to be associated with them. I got a text from Lily yesterday. It's weird to have a daughter with a phone. And uh, they were volunteering up at the airport yesterday because there was a... They, didn't, they said, don't call it an air show. Air show? It was a fly-in, not an air show. So anyway, they got involved in helping out with that, and they were helping with the folks that were taking people up in airplanes. They were getting them buckled in, and my son was pushing the airplanes out onto the runway and all the rest. And so at the end of the day, my daughter texts me, and she says, hey, I'm going to be flying over the house in a few minutes. And so me and all of the little boys ran outside and waved at the plane as she made it pass over the house. It was cool. And then she said shortly after that, she flew it all the way back to the airport. Like, she got to fly the plane. So, yeah, it was cool. It's cool to see that. It's cool to, like, I feel like I'm having all of these experiences, but I'm not. Just because my kids are, it's, it's cool. Anyway, that's my, uh, my report of my week, of my kids' week. I had never asked you how Jeff's doing. How's Jeff doing? He's, he's better. He still gets a little fatigued, but he's way, way better. Yeah. I, I talked to him, I think it was Wednesday, and I thought, man, that's kind of negligent of me not to talk to him since then. <laughs> <laughs> but he told me then that he was feeling a lot better, just the fatigue stuff. So that's good to hear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, he'll be back soon. I just told him, we'll just keep going until we see you again. So let us know. Rest up and do whatever you need to do. So, yeah. Uh, all right. So the normal applies for our announcements. I don't think we have anything new coming up. Um, the women's summertime luncheon is the biggest thing that we have coming up on the 17th of June um, at the McIntosh's house which is also where we have our Friday mornings uh, men's study. I've missed like the last two or three. I always get like right there with my study time and it's like I can go to the men's study or I can kill myself all day Saturday. So, sorry guys, <laughs> been missing them. We have what? Oh, we talked about that last week. but. I mean, run them. That's okay. We can fill the time. 
we have, is there any new, nope. So um, Bill and Tammy Misplay were asking for renewed prayer because they, uh, Bill took a kind of a dive after last week. He was here on Sunday and he was looking great. And then um, he was up in Spokane for his treatments and kind of tanked up there. So um, we would just want to keep them right in the forefront of our prayers, um, especially for right now. That was a couple of days ago, right, that they texted us about that. And um, I haven't heard since then how they're doing. And so um, who else do we have here? Uh, Lena Williams. I actually talked to her the other day, and she sounds like she's doing really well. Um, Dave and Margaret Just, praying for you guys. Daryl Stiving, and of course, uh, David Klein. And for all of those among us, it seems like we have a lot of folks who have lost loved ones lately or who are dealing with people at the end of their lives. So especially want to be praying for those folks this morning. And for our servicemen and women, I almost forgot them. Let's not forget them. lot of faces to pray for. And of course, we know some of these folks are out. They're not active duty anymore, but we still pray for them because they need it still. And for our local first responders, let's pray. Lord, we thank you again for our opportunity to gather here in your name, to fellowship together, to worship you together, to study your word together. Lord, we are a body, and we need all of the other members of our body. And so, Lord, we pray that you would help us to have a sweet time of fellowship and of worship. Uh, Help us to have uh, hearts that that can be open to hearing from you and to also speak into the lives of other people around us. So, Lord, as we worship you, Lord, we want to lift up those who uh, can't be here among us because they're sick, Jeff and Bill and Tammy, Lord. Uh, pray that you would be continuing, continuing to touch their bodies, and uh, Lord, we uh, trust in your will for them. And Lord, also for the folks that are close to our hearts who are in harm's way in one way or another, the people in the armed forces or for our, our local sheriffs and, and highway patrolmen and fire department and police, Lord, we pray that you would uh, keep your hand of protection upon them as well. And for them who, that can't be here with us, uh, because of those jobs, Lord, we pray that you would uh, just help them to feel your presence this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's rise. Your love, O oh Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness stretches to the sky. Your righteousness is like mighty mountains. Your justice flows just like the ocean's tide. Your love, O oh Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness stretches to the sky. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Your justice flows just like the ocean's tide. And 
And I will lift my high voice to worship you, my King. And I will find my high strength in the shadow of your wings. Your love, oh Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness stretches to the sky. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Your justice flows just like the ocean tide. And I will lift my high voice to worship you, my King. And I will find my high strength in the shadow of your wing. And I will lift my high voice to worship you, my King. And I will find my high strength in the shadow of your wings. Your love, O oh Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness stretches to the sky.
Jesus loves me. You can be seated if you wish. Father, we do thank you for your love for us. It's unconditional and it's it's pure and it's holy lord and may we love you back with all we have all we are lord we thank you so much that um you've brought us into your kingdom through the cross of christ and for that we are so thankful and may our lives reveal that each and every day in jesus name amen Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest, and without you, I fall apart, you're the one who guides my heart. Lord, I need you, oh, I need you, every hour I need you, my one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Where sin runs deep, your grace is more. What grace is found is where you are. And where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. And where you You're my hope and stay. When I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Oh, God, how 
in the morning when I rise in the morning when I rise in the morning when I rise give me Jesus give me Lord, we're so grateful. We're so grateful that you have given us Jesus, Lord, that he is all we need. Lord, we thank you for this time that we could gather together in your throne room and worship you, lift up praises to you. Lord, I pray that you would help us to continue that heart of worship, that mindset of 
humility before you as we study your word. Lord, I pray that you would open up our hearts and minds to hear from you and that we would be able to take your word and apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right. So today, the plan, my plan at least, is to finish the book of Luke, which I was really kind of shocked how quickly that came and went. Um, But before we actually get there, there's something that I wanted to talk about that I kind of ignored last Sunday. When we were um, studying about the two men on the road to Emmaus, um, after Jesus revealed himself to them, they ran back to Jerusalem, remember, and they are bringing word of their encounter to all of the rest of Jesus' followers as they're gathered together. So the 11 plus the group at large. And I misunderstood the last few verses of that passage. This is Luke 24, verses 33 through 35. And it says, And they arose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven, and those who were with with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how uh, he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. And so the way I read that, this is a confession, right? The way that I read that, the two guys from Emmaus came into the door and announced, Jesus is risen, and he appeared to Simon. And I thought, why is that their message? Like, Jesus just spent hours and hours talking to them from the scriptures about how he rose from the dead. Where did Simon come into this? Because Simon wasn't even with them. Simon was back in Jerusalem. That's Peter, by the way, Simon Peter. And so I looked at that, and I thought, I don't understand that. I'm not even going to talk about it. I'm just going to read over that, and hopefully nobody pays attention. Well, (laughs) yeah, right. You guys paid attention, and before I even got home, I had some text messages on my phone. Hey, what's this about? Why, who's, where did Simon come in? People were asking me. So I'm glad, honestly, I'm very glad that you guys didn't let me get away with that, Okay. Because I I realized, after I looked at it some more, I realized it was a a problem of my reading comprehension. It wasn't the two travelers who walked in and said that, that Jesus had appeared to Simon. It was the group that were still in Jerusalem. They were the ones that said, hey guys, welcome back. Jesus appeared to Peter while you were gone. That's what happened. If you read it again, it says, they found the 11 and those who were with them gathered together saying... The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. So you would think that by this point I would be able to read correctly, but I didn't. Um, and I, I wanted to point that out because you've got to watch people like me. <laughs> you've got to pay attention, and you can't let us get away with anything. I, I'm a flawed human being. I'm not like some extra better than anybody else at understanding the Bible or nothing else. I'm just... A guy, and I, and I know I've heard people express the belief that when their pastor is teaching because the, the Holy Spirit is working through them, that they can't say anything wrong, that they're infallible. I've heard people say that, and it, it's, I, I see, I'm glad to see the look of shock on your faces because, man, there is a lot of shady guys out there who claim to be preaching the gospel. So, I'm glad that you guys called me out on that and you don't let me get away with that. And I'm also glad that you guys are paying attention and you're not just swallowing everything that is said from this pulpit hook, line, and sinker. And so continue to ask questions. I like questions. I know Jeff likes questions, uh, as long as they're not stupid questions. <laughs> My favorite saying is that they're, they're, there's no such thing as a stupid question, right? But there are a lot of inquisitive idiots. And I say that about myself because I have to ask a lot of questions. I am an idiot. So please continue to ask questions. I won't call you an idiot. Um, So all that to say, I didn't actually answer the question, what's the deal with, with Simon Peter, right? Because you read this book of Luke and you read about Jesus, um, rising from the dead. And it was the angels that met Mary and the rest of the tomb. And then 
it doesn't record it in Luke, but he, Jesus appeared to those women also. And then later on, you see Jesus appearing to the two men at Emmaus, and there's no mention of Peter ever being, getting this special appearance from Jesus. And so what's, what's the deal with that? And I'm afraid the answer really isn't all that satisfying because um, it happened off the record. None of the gospels record this special appearance to Peter of Jesus before appearing to all the, re the rest. It's just not recorded for us. Um, however, it was apparently common knowledge at the time. Everybody knew about it. Nobody actually knew the details. Paul, who didn't even really know Peter that well, talked about it. This is 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through, through 5. It says, For I delivered to you, as of the first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according with the Scriptures, that he was buried, and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve. Cephas, another name for Simon or Peter, Cephas. So everybody knew about it, but for some reason... And this seems really intentional to me. Nobody recorded what took place. And I think that was just God deciding, hey, this is just me and Peter. You know, nobody else gets to know about what happened with us, the conversation that went down that way. So that's interesting to think about, but we don't really have a very satisfying answer for our curiosity there. So that was a little aside. I needed to get that out of the way. You guys need to know that I make mistakes. And I sometimes try to weasel out of teaching certain things. So keep on calling me on it. We are going to pick up in Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 36. And we left off with those two guys from Emmaus and the rest of the group just sharing their experiences about Jesus' uh, encounters with them or their encounters with Jesus. So here we are, Luke 24, verse 36. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. So I, I kind of feel sorry for these guys, or at least I sympathize with them, uh, especially that they thought maybe they were seeing a ghost. They had had a very confusing and emotional day, if you think about it from their perspective. You know, even if they were just the people that stayed in the room all day and they didn't get an appearance of Jesus, not the two guys from Emmaus or just, uh, or the, the women at the tomb. Imagine just being one of the people in that room, say this size, a group, right? And you're just hanging out in this room all day long and people keep busting in the door and saying, hey, I just saw Jesus. And they're like, what? Like how? And then of course, then suddenly at the end of this day of, I mean, it would be a roller coaster after three days of, of wishing that you could see Jesus again, all of a sudden everybody's seen him. Then Jesus suddenly is just here in the room with us. And, you know, they're startled. It says they're frightened. They've probably got a million questions of, hey, if Jesus was crucified and we saw that happen, how is he here now? How did he walk to Emmaus? How did he get out of the tomb? And honestly, none of those questions have an answer that's not far-fetched to the natural, like, human way of thinking. There's no f answer that's like, oh, yeah, of course. He just rose from the dead. And so Jesus as a spirit, that's one possible far-fetched way of answering how Jesus got in this room without coming in through the door. And so that's, I, I kind of sympathize with that, except that Jesus was not a spirit. Um, and this is actually an important thing, especially for the, the Christian church at the time that Luke wrote this gospel, because they were fighting a sort of heresy known as the Gnostics. It was one of the first huge heresies to come over the church in the early days. And we have now people that we that they call themselves agnostics. That's a different group, right? Agnostic means we don't know because they don't know if God is around. They don't know if God is even approachable, if he was in existence. We don't know. That's what agnostic means. Gnostics are different, and they felt that, or they were called Gnostics because they believed that their teaching was based on secret knowledge that some of them sort of had whispered in their ear by dead saints or something. I'm not, I'm not really sure exactly where they got their information, but they were Gnostics because they had secret knowledge. 
And one of their big things, they had a lot of strange teachings. One of the main ones was the idea that all physical matter was inherently evil, like the rocks, the trees, your human body, all of it is evil. And so that became a problem when you think about Jesus being incarnated as a human being. How can sinless, perfect God have a human body if human bodies are inherently evil? Was he somehow sinful also? No. And so the way that they answered that problem is they just said, well, Jesus didn't have a body. He wasn't a human being. He was just a spirit. He was a ghost. And so they had to go through all of these ridiculous hoops to jump through to, to figure out, hey, how do you line up all of the physical things that Jesus did on the earth if he wasn't actually a physical person? Well, he just tricked everybody all the time. He would pretend to take a bite and move his mouth, and then he would just magic away that, bar that piece of the bread or something. Like, this is the kind of things that they taught. And so while I was studying about Simon of Cyrene, remember the guy that carried Jesus' cross? I found possibly the strangest of the Gnostic ideas. Uh, and it, it's funny to me. It's horrible, but it's also funny. Uh, because obviously, if Jesus didn't have a body, the idea of crucifixion becomes really strange. How did they do that? Well, they say that when Simon took up Jesus' cross and, get, and carried it the rest of the way for him. Jesus did his, you know, Holy Ghost magic and changed their appearances. So now Jesus looks like Simon of Cyrene, and Simon of Cyrene looks like Jesus. And so then Simon of Cyrene underwent crucifixion. And the Romans didn't realize that they were actually crucifying just some bystander. And Jesus, the very convincing ghost, was standing off to the side, making fun of the Romans as this all happened. Ridiculous, right? I mean, how do you read the Bible and think that's what actually happened? But they had their, their secret knowledge. And so it's, it sounds like a joke to me, but it's not. And, and if you read, like, look up Simon of Cyrene on Wikipedia and you'll see an article and it d details that exact thing and like the guy that wrote it down, all the rest. It's, it was a huge thing in the early church. And I think it was like, 200 years they were sort of going back and forth and trying to rid the church of this heresy. And so when Luke wrote his gospel, this heresy was sort of gaining traction in the church. And even though it sounds ridiculous, there was a lot of danger to this belief system. And you can see it if you take their beliefs to the logical end. If all of human physical existence is inherently evil, then there's no possible way that you can live a life that's pleasing to God. You can't do it because no matter what you do, you're doing it in a physical body and so it becomes an evil act. And so what's the point then of loving your neighbor as you love yourself if it's the equivalent of murdering your neighbor because it's all evil no matter what you do. And so it ended up just being a sort of um, hedonistic teaching of do whatever you want because it doesn't matter. Except that when you read the Gospel of Luke, he makes it clear over and over and over again what we do, how we live is eternally important, incredibly important. So that's why Luke is about to go through a sort of comprehensive list of things that Jesus did in his physical body after he rose from the dead because he wants everyone to be 100% clear he wasn't just a spirit. He wasn't just a ghost. Verse uh, 38 of chapter 24. And he said to them, why are you troubled and why do, you, do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and feet that it is I myself. Touch me and see for a spirit does, does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of boiled, broiled fish and he took it and ate it before them. So Jesus did all of these things to prove that he was alive 
and that he had been bodily resurrected. He wasn't just a spirit, you know, touch me. You can feel I'm not a ghost. Um, and he even ate there in front of them. So Jesus was human. He took on flesh and blood, and that belief is incredibly important to us, not just for the things that I've already mentioned, but if Jesus was not just as human as I am, then his death on the behalf of my human sins isn't effective, right? It, the death of sheep and goats weren't able to take away the sins of the Jews. It could kind of just give a Band-Aid for them for a little while. It needed a human sacrifice to pay for my human sins. And so it's important. Jesus was a human being, not just a ghost, not just God pretending to be a human being. And even more than that, or not more than that, but along with that is the idea that the things that Jesus did, the example that he set for us, because he was a man, that example is viable for me to follow also. Does that make sense? If um, Jesus laid out all of these things, like we have the, the Old Testament law, right? And it's all just do this, don't do that, do this, don't do that. And Israel found it completely impossible. We can't do that, God. We can't live up to that standard. But as we've been studying through, through Luke, we've been getting all of these instructions that God lays out for us. You know, before you decide to take the plank out of somebody else's eye, or the speck, remove the plank from your own eye. He said, love your neighbor as you love yourself. He said, um, take up your cross and follow me. All of these things Jesus gave us, and we kind of collected them together, and we, we do our best to apply God's word to our life, to live it out, to not just take the information in and think about it, but, but to live it out, right? And of course, we struggle, we fail, but that's not because the instructions and the example that he gave us are impossible for us. Jesus was a man, and he was able to model out the behavior that he wanted us to follow. Now, there's probably a lot of people thinking, yeah, but Jesus wasn't just a man. Jesus wasn't just a human being. He was also God. And so that's how he was able to live out those things. How can I possibly expect to be able to live like Jesus when he was able to do it by the power of God? Well, that's a good question to ask. How are we going to be able to live out the example that Jesus gave us if he had to have the power of God for it? Well, we're going to have to have the power of God for it too, right? Well, that's a, good, that's a thing that I want you to keep in mind when we get to the further instructions that we're going to get to in a minute. Verse 44. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. So when the women at the tomb encountered the angels, the angels said, Hey, remember what Jesus taught you about how he was going to die and rose again. And then Jesus did the same kind of thing with the two men on the road to Emmaus as they walked there uh, in Luke 24, verse 26 and 7. He said, Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So when Jesus appeared to people, he was making sure repeatedly that they understood what the word of God had to say about him. That was very important. And so now he's doing it again to the group at large. Hey guys, here's the scriptures. And he opened their minds so that they could understand what the word of God said about his death, death and resurrection. And immediately after that, he begins to talk about their new responsibility, their commission, the great commission. Verse 46. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things and behold, I am sending the promise of my father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. So this is Luke's version of the Great Commission. And the Great Commission is a lot more than just a job to do. And, you know, Jesus said to us, hey, you are my witnesses. 
And that's what you are. That's not a thing that you do. And I, I think about this. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, I went to a, a summer camp and uh, John Corson was one of the, the teachers at the summer camp. And he talked to us about how when God calls us, he doesn't want, you know, a slice of the pie that is our life. He doesn't want, he, he referred to it as a Swanson's uh, microwave dinner. You know, you've got your chicken on one side and your peas. It's like the corn was always the worst one. If you got one with corn in them, it was horrible. And he doesn't want a part of your life. He wants the chicken pot pie, Swanson's chicken pot pie, where it's all together in one thing, he, you know? And so you, you don't segment your life up as like, this is my work and this is my family. And then over here, God gets this part. No, God wants all of it. And so when he calls us as his witnesses, that's all of our lives, not just a thing that you do, a project that you work on when you have some spare time. Oh, I'm going to go fulfill the great commission today. No, it's everything that we, you do in your life is part of the great commission. And that is the thing that we have been talking about sort of from a different angle as we've talked about the theme of Luke, uh, you know, through the rest of the book of Luke. Um, all along, the theme of Luke that we've been talking about is the contrast between living for the life that we could build here or living for eternity. You know, you can live for the here and now, and a lot of people do. You can live for fun. You can live for accomplishments. You can live for respect from your peers. A lot of people live for the misery that they have in their life and they just pile it up and hold on to it. Or they live for relationships, whatever. You can live for the here and now and there's a lot of things that the here and now has to offer us. But it's not going to last. And no matter what sort of life you build in the here and now, it's only going to be temporary. Uh, Jesus talked about this in a parable in Luke chapter 12, uh, 12, 16 through 21. And he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do for I have nowhere to store my crops? And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. And this idea comes up over and over and over again throughout Luke and probably the rest of the Bible also. I'm just, you know, I, I don't know that this is necessarily the only theme of Luke, but it's just the thing that God wanted me to see as we were studying together through the book of Luke, this is what stuck out to me more, more than anything else. But it's the idea that there's a lot of ways that you can find comfort and safety in the here and now, but those things don't last and eventually they go away. And those, on the contrast, those who freely give up the comforts and the safety of the here and now, they find eternal safety. They find eternal comfort. Remember Jesus' conversation with the rich young ruler. This is in Luke chapter 18. And starting in verse 22, it says, When Jesus heard this, he said to him, One thing you still lack. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. And Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said, How difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of heaven. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. So the rich young ruler, he had a great life here on this earth, right? He had it all. But Jesus recognized that he was clinging to that life and it was preventing him from obtaining the eternal life that he said he was looking for. And so Jesus told him, hey, you need to give all that up. That's becoming a hindrance for you. You're, you're clinging to the boat anchor and it's dragging you down. Let it go. And you'll be able to find eternal life. And then after this conversation, he turns to his disciples and says, look how hard it is for those who have it, have it all, who have the possessions here on this earth, it's hard for them to enter the kingdom of heaven. He said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. That's hard. And so look how they respond to him. Luke 18, verse 26 those who heard it said, then who can be saved? But he said, what is impossible with man 
is possible with God. And Peter said, see, we have left our homes and followed you. And he said to them, truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come eternal life. So this is the contrast throughout the book of Luke, living for the here and now or living for eternity. Follow Jesus no matter the cost and you will find eternal reward and eternal satisfaction. And so now as Jesus is talking about the great commission as an all-encompassing way of life, that fits right into the book of, of Luke's theme of living for eternal matters. Because when you're fulfilling the great commission, that's an eternal matter. That's an eternal thing. And so we put together all of those ideas from the book of Luke that we've collected of loving your neighbor as you love yourself, of, you know, turning the other cheek, of taking up your cross. All of those things, we take them together, and when we live out the word of God that Jesus gives us, and we are living for eternity, we are fulfilling the great commission, even if you're not standing on a street corner yelling the gospel at people. And so, it's, it's a, uh, the great commission is something that we're supposed to proclaim naturally, organically, I guess, is a way to think of it, as we live out the word of God. And sometimes we preach. Sometimes we give to the poor. Sometimes we just turn the other cheek. And all of those things are part of the Great Commission. And Jesus demonstrated that. As he died on the cross, he wasn't preaching a sermon from the cross. He wasn't preaching to the thief who was next to him. He wasn't preaching to the centurion on the ground. He was just loving his enemies. And those people saw that and thought, I want that. I want to be where he, wherever he's going. I want to go there with him. And so... We have these marching orders, right? Fulfill the Great Commission. Go Wherever you go, bring the gospel. Preach about the, the death and resurrection of Jesus. Proclaim the forgiveness of sins and repentance and those things. And we even have Jesus as our example. But like I said before, we fail a lot of times at living out the things that we know that we're supposed to be doing. Jesus said, love your enemies as you love yourself. And guys, that's hard to do. That's hard to do. It's hard to turn the other cheek. It's hard to take up your cross and follow Jesus. I had one of those weeks where, this, you know, I had a, a little minor problem that blew up, and I realized that minor problem that blew up, that's my sin. That, that, that minor problem that, that caused all of the rest of the blow up, that was because I had sin in my life. And it just blew up and created a problem. And hey, you know, I know that I wasn't supposed to be living that way. I knew that I was supposed to be putting others before myself, for example, but I wasn't, and it became the problem. And I, I know over and over again, I fail to live up to the things that Jesus told me to do. I, I know the right thing to do, but I don't find the power to do it in myself. And I know that I'm not alone. I know that I'm not the only person who goes through that, right? And I don't have to ask you. I know that you would, you would probably raise your hand because Paul told me about it. Paul confessed to having the same problem. In Romans chapter 7, uh, 18 and 19, he says, For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want, but the evil that I do not want is what I keep on doing. And Paul goes on and on through Romans chapter 7. Romans 7 is a difficult chapter to read because it's all about, hey, I want to do good and I don't. I, I want to live for Jesus, but I end up living for myself and I fail and I fail and I fail. And he gets to the end finally, and he concludes Romans 7, 24, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? And that's, that's a guy that's defeated. That's a guy that, that has run up against his own flesh over and over and over again. He sees the standard, but he can't, he can't reach it on his own. But here's the thing. God doesn't expect us to reach it on our own. God knows that we're sinful. He knows that we're human. He knows that we're weak. And he knows that we can't do it on our own. And that's why he gives us the Holy Spirit. And in Luke 24, Jesus told his, his people, 
Behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Jesus talked about the gift of the Holy Spirit, not the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promise of the Father. He talked about it when he was still here, before his crucifixion. John chapter 16, starting in verse 7. And if you want to learn about the Holy Spirit, John 14, 15, and 16 are a great place to start. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. So that's the power from on high that we need, that the disciples were waiting for. And it's interesting that the power that is going to come upon us and help us to live is what's going to be the fulfillment of the Great Commission. Those things that, that Jesus talked about, about convicting the world of sin and righteousness of death, that's the goal of the Great Commission because that's how people enter into the kingdom of heaven. The Great Commission is about living for Jesus and people seeing you and saying, hey, I want to live for Jesus also bringing more people into the kingdom of heaven. And that's what, what the Holy Spirit is going to do. So Paul, who we just read his defeat in Romans 7, he also talked about the victory of a life that's lived by the power of the Holy Spirit in Romans chapter 8. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it cannot submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. For those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. And Jesus promised the Spirit to us. Uh, he commanded the disciples to stay in Jerusalem, wait for the promise of the Spirit. And so they did. Uh, back in Luke 24, verse 50. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple, blessing God. So that's the end of, of Luke. And it kind of ends on what I the way I see it, it's kind of a partial, uh, it's only partially resolved, right? The, the disciples heard Jesus' promises. He appeared to them. He explained the scriptures to them. He gave them the great commission. He said, hey, go back to Jerusalem. They watched him ascend up into heaven. And it says that they, they did that. They went back to, the, to Jerusalem and they waited for the promise of the spirit. But they didn't receive it yet not by the end of Luke, right? And, and when you read about the things that they were doing, it says they were, they were blessed, they had great joy, uh, but they weren't proclaiming the death and resurrection of Jesus. They weren't yet living out, you know, repentance for the forgiveness of sins yet. It says that they were uh, mostly just keeping to themselves, worshiping God, going to the temple, but the Great Commission was not yet getting lived out in their lives. And of course, you know the rest of the story in Acts, that changes drastically. When they received the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, all of a sudden, what was it, 3,000 people were added on that one day because they had the power then at that point. And we have the same calling that those disciples had. God called us, just like them, to proclaim his death and resurrection and the repentance of sins through the way that we live our lives. That's the calling that God has on us. It's not just them. It's not just for people in the ministry. It's for all of the church. All of us are called to live that way. Not just the, the microwave dinner, the chicken pot pie, all of your life. So we have the calling and he also has promised to all of us the Holy Spirit to fulfill that promise. So I don't want to get ahead of myself because this is the first week of June, right? And this is where we're living right now. Next week, my plan 
if God wills, we're going to start the book Acts. So we're going to get to see the fulfillment of that. I was kind of on the fence, and even this morning I was on the fence of whether or not I was going to cop to that, if I was going to admit we're going to start Acts next. Um, and that probably is just going to be a Wednesday night thing. But, yeah, that's what we're doing, if, you know, God wills it. So as the, uh, the first week of the month, we have communion today. And I love that in communion, we have more of the fulfillment of that great commission, right? In um, the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 11, Paul was talking about communion, and he said, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which was for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So it's just another way that we get to not only celebrate among ourselves, hey, God died for us so that we could be forgiven. Our sins are washed away. We have mercy. But also it's a way that we are proclaiming his death to the people around us. So I'm going to pray. We're going to sing together while uh, the men come up to distribute the food, or the food, the communion bread and the juice. Um, and we're going to pray for Tom and Denny Dax, who baked our communion bread this morning. And then we're going to take it together. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we stand in awe of your incredible plan that you worked out from the beginning of time, that you would pay the, cross, the cost of our sins on the cross, that you would open up your throne room to your children, that we would be made whole, that we would be made clean by the blood of Jesus. Lord, we thank you also for the promise of the Spirit that you have given us his power to live. By the Holy Spirit, we can fulfill your commandments. We can walk in the Spirit. We can please you by our lives. And Lord, we know that we often fail still. Lord, we find that we battle against the flesh and we know that you have mercy for us still. That you uh, wash away our sins continually. So Lord, as we spend this, this time now remembering your death and resurrection, as we uh, physically take it in, Lord, I pray that you would r remind us of your mercy, that you would remind us of your restoration that you do to our lives. And that in these things we would not only glorify you, but also glorify you among the people around us, that they would hear and see Jesus when they see us. In Jesus' name, amen. So if the men would come up and distribute communion. Jewel, 
Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy my shame rising again i bless your name you are my all in all when i fall down you pick me up when i am dry you fill my cup you are my all in all jesus lamb of god Lord, you are worthy. You are worthy. As we hold these elements of, of your death in our hands, we, are, we acknowledge you're, you're worthy. You were worthy to take our place. You were worthy to wash away the sins of the world. Lord, and we know that that is effective for our lives, that by your death, we have been washed clean, that you have given us mercy and by your resurrection, we also have life, the same that you do. Let's partake together. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you so much for your death and resurrection on our behalf. Lord, I pray that you would give us your Holy Spirit, the strength to live out your life for the rest of ours that we would live for you. And whenever we fail, Lord, we know that, that you have mercy, the fresh filling of your spirit, and the power to, to continue to live for you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I stand for one last song. Splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide. And trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Stands, and time is in his hands, beginning and the end, beginning and the end. And the Godhead three in one, Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, 
Not much to add to that. How great is our God. All right, guys, have a great week. God bless you. Thank you for being here. I'm glad that I got to go through the end of Luke the last three weeks with you guys. It was a blessing for me. Yeah, we got to stack chairs. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, this might be the last time. Cool.